in the there we go well um welcome everyone as uh, you possibly just heard angus uh, referring to tom sends his apologies he's indisposed well truth be told he's got covid but uh, uh, so I think he's had a, a long day sort of thing, so we, we let him off. Um, and uh, he'll be uh, back with us soon, I'm quite sure. Um, the, we let him off partly because there really wasn't very much to pass on to you. That There's uh, another lecture next week. I'll just remind everybody about uh, that when we have the joint, uh, joint lecture with the Mining Institute of Scotland. And... Uh, Mark Austin will be talking about the Clogo uh, gold uh, mine in uh, North Wales. Um, and the other bit of news is that with the, um, uh, despite Tom's uh, affliction, as it were, uh, with the sort of moderation in COVID uh, numbers and all the rest of it, um, we are looking to uh, being able to go back to the uh, Grant Institute, to the Hutton Lecture Theatre from March onwards. And it probably means that the uh, Clough Medal Lecture will be the first uh, lecture that we're able to have in the, uh, in the Hutton Lecture Theatre again. Now that's not confirmed. Uh, we're uh, working our way through the risk assessments and all the rest of it. So it'll be a first come first served uh, basis. I think we're restricted to 50 people in the lecture theatre, but we'll keep you posted as things go along. But uh, it looks like uh, we might be able to get back into the into the Hutton um, next month, and, <clears throat> but we'll still operate on a hybrid basis anyway. So the Zoom connections will be there as well. So to this evening's uh, lecture, and uh, it's um, my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Kevin Smith. Um, I've well, sorry, I worked alongside uh, uh, Kevin particularly, but uh, we were both uh, employed with BGS in the Murchison House days. Um, and so I, had a, I remember a few conversations with Kevin over various uh, structural complexities on various topics. Um, Kevin joined BGS, uh, he tells me, in uh, 1976, and at that time he was actually uh, engaged to the <clears throat> employed by the Metalliferous Minerals Unit, as they called themselves at that time, based in London, and he worked on various uh, volcanic exhalative mineralization prospects in Scotland, in Devon, uh, and Cornwall. Um, and uh, in fact, he did some of the earliest, or he was involved in some of the earliest deep overburden sampling at what became the Foss Bearite mine near Aberfeldy. Um, that was uh, in the depths of the winter, uh, December 1977. So that probably has its own story to tell. Um, he joined the Deep Geology Unit in Keyworth uh, in 1982 and uh, began his work on onshore hydrocarbon exploration. Um, and uh, but then transferred to the offshore hydrocarbon program in Edinburgh in um, the late 80s, 1987, um, <clears throat> where he uh, interpreted seismic reflection data from various basins, mainly the North Sea, North sea and west of Shetlands, but uh, was also able to look at data from the Falklands and from the Gulf of Guinea. So Kevin uh, tells me that although BGS classified him as both a geochemist and a geophysicist, uh, for their own uh, purposes, best known to themselves. Uh, he sees himself really as a, a retired geologist. So uh, uh, there's, uh, there's more than a few of those around. So this evening, Kevin is going to talk to us about um, things that um, he has been puzzling over uh, in the context of the, the 40s, uh, uh, the Rattray Volcanic Province in the Central North Sea. And um, I think by the looks of the title, Kevin's going to be reviewing some uh, 50 years of research or 50 years of thinking on the uh, uh, on the 40s volcanic province. So, Kevin, I'll hand over to you and um, I look forward to this. Thank you. Thank you. That's looking great, Kevin. 
You can hear me fine. Yep, absolutely fine. So I'll start straight away and say that the 40s volcanic province was discovered in 1970 by the same well that discovered the 40s oil field. It recently came in the news when the whole structure of the province was reinterpreted and it was renamed in a paper which claimed that previous interpretations had hindered Britain's oil exploration effort. It wasn't until 2020 that I became that I was one of the main authors of this so-called volcano myth, and I'd created some of these phantom volcanoes. Nineteen seventy was also the year that I first stood inside a volcano. On this field trip to Aaron, we went to visit the central ring complex, and we actually called in it one of the outcrops where chalk is preserved, which Mark uh, Wilkinson was talking about in his recent presentation to this society. Uh, back in nineteen seventy. Plate tectonics and the geology of the North Sea were not on the syllabus, but uh, one of the main advantages of plate tectonics was that it explained the distribution of most of the Earth's volcanism. By 1971, people were trying to explain the rest of the Earth's volcanism, the stuff that occurred away from plate margins. This became known as intraplate or midplate volcanism. And uh, partly to explain that is when uh, Jason Morgan invented the idea of a mantle plume. Just when people started getting interested in mantle plumes in a continental setting, I found myself standing in the middle of another volcano. And this one was in Darfur in the Western Sudan. Fortunately, you don't have to go to Darfur to see volcanic landforms like this, because they're all around us here in Edinburgh. Every time I drive along the A1 and go past Trap Rain Law, I'm reminded of this mountain in the Sudan, which I geochemically sampled and is also composed of phonolite. The first account of the 40s volcanic province was written by Frank Howard. He produced this map in the year that the 40s oil field came on stream, and he generated a map of known lava thickness at that time, and he superimposed it on a map of the magnetic intensity of the area. And one of the things that he pointed out was the existence of this major magnetic anomaly, which I've labeled here and I wrote. And he said that might be equivalent to some related igneous activity at depth. Although he didn't have very much information, he didn't refrain from venturing that there must be some volcanic vents in the area. And he said, here three of them are aligned in an east southeasterly or easterly direction. At the same time, BGS were interpreting the same information and they came up with a different model. They suggested that the volcanics were preserved in fault controlled basins and were intruded from fissures or dikes. Because of this structural model, they ended up with a much greater isopack thickness of lavas. Here we've got up to 3,000 3, meters of lavas, and it's this volume that people have quoted commonly ever since. They also pointed out the existence of the Fisher Bank magnetic anomaly, and they said that they had uh, a, a model of that potential intrusion, and, and they said that it possibly extended downwards from a minimum depth of eight kilometers. At the same time, people are learning more about the fascies of the Middle Jurassic and they found it was concentrically disposed around the 40s volcanic province. 
which lay in an area of uplift. These observations led Einid to suggest the possible involvement of a mantle plume in the area. And the area of uplift was found to coincide with the area where the three arms of the central north of the uh, Jurassic Graben in, in the North Sea intersected. And this became known as the triple junction, partly because it did have mantle plume associations. People were saying triple junctions were something related to mantle plumes. Similarly, from regional studies, it was soon apparent that the terrestrial 40s volcanoes were unlapped by upper Jurassic marine sediments. As Graham said, I didn't join the hydrocarbons unit in Edinburgh until 1987. So now I could see a volcano every day on my way to work. And sometimes it is a bit reminiscent of the Bay of Naples. I joined the Central North Sea team, advising the government on the prospectivity of the Central North Sea. And this is a seismic profile around about that time. And in fact, you'll see that there's no Middle Jurassic identified on this seismic section. The one reason is that it's absent from the graben margins, and the other reason is it's off the base of this section. In the West Central Graben, it's commonly at a depth of around about five kilometers. And it was that area which I ha first had to. That was my first project area when I arrived in uh, Edinburgh. The other feature that's apparent on this seismic section is the presence of a sextine, and it tells you that by the start of the Jurassic, the Zechstein was already fully mobilized in the Central North Sea. It contrasts with the Southern North Sea, the, the Jurassic, the uh, Zechstein salt, which is about a kilometer thick in the Central North Sea, had already rearranged itself by halokinesis into lots of salt walls. And some of these subsequently developed into divers. I found myself working alongside my colleague, my new colleague, Derek Ritchie, in the Central North Sea, and we ended up working together on a number of regional assessment uh, programs. And around about this time, he just published uh, an Argon Argon date from the 40s volcanic province, which had a rather surprising result, that the which disagreed with the stratigraphic age of the um, 40s volcanics, as it was then understood. So it came up with a younger age. And that remained unexplained. Because of his, the age date that he published, Derek had some contact with a Edinburgh University postgraduate student called Dave Latted. He was doing a PhD trying to investigate if there was a relationship between the amount of lithospheric stretching in the North Sea and the development of the volcanics. He subsequently concluded that some additional factor was probably involved, some which to raise the isotherms so that the volcanics could be developed. But as we pointed out to Dave Latin and Nikki White when they came to see us in the Central North Sea office room where we worked. We, we, uh, we pointed out that actually most of the extension in the North Sea was after the volcanics, so it could hardly have caused the volcanics. And this was also indicated by Henry in 1993. One of the observations that Dave Latin made was based on some analyses undertaken at Edinburgh University of uh, lavas from the Sao Tome area in the Gulf of Giddy. And they directly compared the chemistry of the more widespread lavas in the general North Sea area with those in Sao Tome. One observation you can make if you go to Sao Tome is that there are two lots of volcanic uh, 
developments. One is a the eroded stump of a basaltic shield with uh, one of light plugs poking through it, and the other is a development of much more recent scoria cones. And this is a common feature of interplate volcanic areas where you get one basaltic shield, it's deeply eroded, and it's followed by more, sharp, uh, more recent scoria cones. Coming out of our regional projects, Derek and I maintain an interest in the volcanic rocks. And that interest was stimulated when we found on this seismic section some dipping reflectors within the middle Jurassic sequence. Now, actually, dipping reflectors are quite rare in volcanic areas. George Walker wrote a whole paper about this. It's like 90% of a volcanic area has dips of less than 10%. So this rather said there was a proximal volcanic vent in this area. And we ended up calling it the Glen Center. And we pinned the actual site of eruption to an aeromagnetic anomaly, which is more effectively displayed on this color display. We just had contour maps in those days. But this is a color display where we marked a potential position of a volcanic center related to the dip in volcanics that we'd observed. When we looked at the Fisher Bank magnetic anomaly, all we established that was that there was a structural high at base Cretaceous level, uh, which overlay the center of the magnetic anomaly. And we suggested that that might be an indication of another volcanic center. Our third volcanic center within this province was the Ivanhoe Volcanic Center. Now this actually lay outside our area of interest because it's in, was the responsibility of another team to map in the outer Moray Firth. But Derek had looked at the wells in that area and prepared this uh, outcrop uh, uh, limit of the volcanics from well data. But we didn't get to look at any seismic data from the outer Moray Firth. We've been trumping other people's uh, area. And we just said that the Ivanhoe Center was another aeromagnetic high, and we didn't see anything more about it. Subsequently, in uh, 1993, uh, uh, Thatcherism caught up with the hydrocarbons unit, and we all had to reapply for our jobs. And the whole unit was uh, disbanded and moved into different sites. I didn't get to work with Derek again for a number of years. And the potential paper that we'd intended, or Derek had intended to write in collaboration with a uh, bona fide geophysicist about the aeromagnetic data was never completed. The main result of our interpretation was that it provided an explanation for Derek's discrepant uh, Hagen Hagen date. So that we had an old center in the Fisher Bank, which was eroded, and we had the younger center with a dip in volcanic rocks at, around Glen. And that was really a sufficient thing to justify the publication of the paper at the time. In 1993, uh, acquisition of seismic data in the North Sea became focused on the acquisition of 3D surveys. And we started to interpret those in the Central North Sea team. And this one, it's from the Outer Moray Firth, which was interpreted by Simon Stewart, one of the world experts in the origin of circular structures. Now, circular structures are pretty difficult to identify on a, on a, uh, a widely spaced grid. You tend to end up with rectangular structures rather than circular ones. But in 3D data, it allows you to see the circularity of things. And Dave, uh, Simon Stewart identified four circular structures on this particular 3D survey. And he decided that they were of volcanic origin. And this one, C1, is really quite a large thing. It compares in scale with the volcano that you saw me standing inside in the Sudan. I'd never really considered the position of um, 
Simon Stewart's volcanic vents until I came to prepare this talk and I superimposed it on maps of my own. But it's, it's clearly apparent from this map that they, they form a sort of east southeasterly trend with the centers identified by Smith and Ritchie. Now we suddenly leap forward 20 years to the model which revised everything and introduced us to the Rattray Volcanic Center, uh, Volcanic Province. This is a paper by Query et al. And they kindly summarized all the previous year's work. They've drawn uh, all the volcanic centers identified by Smith and Ritchie on here. And they've presumed, or they say that our interpretation implied that there were three shallow magma chambers immediately below the volcanics up to a diameter of 16 kilometers. Uh, it's a very detailed reconstruction. You'll not find anything like that in anybody else's publications, but it's a general idea of what we might have implied if we'd carried out further work, I suppose. So the revised model really didn't have any volcanic centers. They avoided using the term, but they did identify volcanoes. And if you look at the section on the left here, D, D dash, it has a volcanic crater on it, something that we could never have spotted in 2D data. But it's quite a substantial size, this crater. It's actually, it's twice the diameter of the crater of Vesuvius. So it means that this intrusion is a, in, within the vent is a large intrusion. Uh, if, you, if you took Arthur's seat, North Berwick Law, the Bass Rock, and Trap Rain Law, they would all fit inside this vent. So it's a big thing. If you look, if you think of the scoria cones around, that would be observing, observed erupting on La Palma. I looked at, I've been Googling, uh, uh, looking at Google Earth, La Palma, and I'm, I looked at about 20 scoria cones there. The, their diameter is uh, 300 meters. This this crater is 1.2 kilometers. It seemed like there was a bit of a scale problem here. They ruled out the Fisher Bank as a deep igneous intrusion related to the Jurassic and said it was possibly the Caledonian intrusion instead. They didn't recognize any vent at the Ivanhoe Center. They just said it was a thick pile of volcanic rocks on a structural high. And they claimed that um, they attributed various origins to Stewart's vents, but they mostly saw them as some diatremes or shallow explosive features. So basically they, they, they moved away from the term volcanic center and used a different term, which they, they tended to use, call them volcanic edifices. And they, they compared their things, which they saw in detail in 3D with vents, along the mid-Atlantic ridge in Iceland. Now, possible reason for that is one of the things that they identified was the dipping structures that Derek and I had observed on 2D seismic and 3D seismic. They claimed that these related to high other class site four sets. Now, if you work in the West of Shetland area, you'll be very familiar with high other class sites because they form a major feature of this, the Faro Shetland escarpment. And here's a seismic section that uh, I interpreted with uh, Sue Stoker and Ian Andrews in 1999 and showed at the Geological Society of London relating to the Faroe Shetland Escarpment. And this is the very sort of structure that you can see. Uh, well, if you were watching the TV, watching YouTube before Christmas, you could have seen a structure like this developing on the coast of La Palma. Of course, at the time the 40s volcano was erupting, the sea wasn't present in the area. So this would have had to, these higher class sites would have need to be erupting into a non-marine body of water, a lake. And because this lava pile here is almost two kilometers thick, about the thickness of the pile of lavas at 
currently uh, present on the board. Um, this body of water would need to be two kilometers deep. It seems a bit unlikely, as there aren't any lakes of that depth on Earth at the moment. The deep world's deepest lake is about 1.1 kilometers deep. So I had doubts about this interpretation, which I uh, incorporated in a discussion of the, uh, rather belatedly, I, as I say, I wasn't aware of these papers until 2020. So belatedly submitted a discussion of this paper to the JOLSOC, which they rejected. In fact, they didn't send it out for peer review. In that paper, I proposed an alternative model for the dips preserved above the Glen Horst. I've been interested in salt withdrawal structures. And when I came back to, to review the 40s volcanic province based on the observations at Crudy et al, I could see that a better explanation for the dip and reflectors preserved on top of the Glen Horst might be related to salt withdrawal. Now, bizarrely, the type of structure that it might be related to has a name. It's been identified by uh, holokinetic geologists in uh, working in Texas, and it's called a mock turtle structure. And turtle structures are very familiar. They're based on normal inverted synclinal basins formed during the first stages of salt withdrawal. They're called turtle structures because they have a, they look like a turtle shell. Mock turtle structures are something different. They develop in a secondary uh, area of uh, salt withdrawal, where you originally had a, a, a diapiric or salt wall structure. And you've got evidence of this in quadrant 29, away from the 40s volcanic province, where you can see this well penetrated a synclinal area of volcanic rocks preserved above, above a sextine salt wall in quadrant 29, related to the puffin center identified by Ritchie, Smith and Ritchie. So mock turtle structures end up with downlapping volcanic events on a on the basal carbonate after the all those extinct has been removed. The reason you get them developed is because you get up a Jurassic extension. In this case, away from the Glen Horst, and the volcanic events end up dipping onto the basal extinct carbonate. And that's exactly what you see in the well that was dated by Derek Ritchie. So when this interpretation was rejected by the Geological Society of London, um, I suspect it didn't really respect it. it was submitted by Mr. Smith of Musselburgh. I, uh, I, I got rather annoyed and I uh, got in touch with Graham Leslie and asked if I could give this talk. And basically this talk could end here. But when I started preparing, preparing this talk, I developed a different structural idea. I took out of the garage this old PSGB map of the North Sea. I tended to draw a section through the 40s volcanic province. And when I got this map out, I discovered I'd already drawn a line of section through the volcanic province in this direction, which is about 125. Uh, this, um, so from the northwest corner of the map to the southeast corner of the map, there's a line passing through the volcanic area at the uh, edge of the Halibut Horst. When you look at the volcanic centers, if, they are, if they're phantom volcanoes, they have this rather symmetrical pattern, which makes you think they're realer than uh, query at how claim. So I, one of the other things that you have to know about the Central North Sea is if you take when you everyone says lithosphere expansion is important, but what it actually means is that Scotland and Norway are up to 70 kilometers further apart than they were in the middle Jurassic. And this extension post dated the volcanism. So what I'm going to propose here is that the thing that provoked the initiation of the volcanism was an episode of trans tension in the middle Jurassic. Trans tension involves a little bit of extension and uh, some strike slip movement. 
basically, if you want to put the 40s volcanic problems back to where they started, you have to remove both those effects. Here, the stretching is expressed as a beta factor, uh, which is equivalent to this amount of stretching that we see uh, between Norway and Scotland. So I've uh, firmed up on the lines that I'm interested in here. I call this section, this line AB, the uh, Fisher Bank line. CD, I've called that the South Halibut Fault. BE is the Yaren Fault, which borders the Yaren High in the Norwegian sector. And CD and BE are parallel to the Great Glen Fault. I've called it the South, South Halibut Fault because it's related to the South Halibut Granite, which is a major Caledonian intrusion. It is major, 60 by 30 kilometers. It's buried beneath the outer Moray Firth and it lies just to the west of the 40s volcanic province. Now, if you, if you see similar granite onshore in Scotland, you've commonly been related to sinistral strike slip faults, like the Great Glen Fault. When I made these observations, I just drew, I haven't got any sophisticated restoration software. I just got out a bit of tracing paper and I, I moved the structural elements of Scotland towards Norway. I've done this before, I worked using coral draw. I haven't got coral draw at the moment, so tracing paper would suffice. But uh, one of the basis of this was the intersections of these volcanoes with this line I've drawn, the Fisher Bank line between the Yaren Fault and the Great Glen Fault. And it became apparent when I looked at the numbers on this line that there was something significant going on. If there's a delay, I wouldn't be able to, on, on the display of the sections, I'm, I'm going to go fairly slowly through these. I was going to go rapidly, but I better go slowly in case you don't keep up. So it's a three, I've got a three-stage restoration. I'm going to move these structural elements of Scotland, to which the rest of Scotland are connected, towards Norway. And the, you can see the result of these movements will be to insert these structural elements into features that are already apparent on the map. So all I've done is I've moved along the direction of the my line AB. Now I've placed the halibut host into an embayment in the flattened ground spur. And essentially what we've done here is we've, we've removed the area by strike step faulting where the volcanoes originated. And we've reduced those volcanoes to a point source. Then all we have to do then is remove the up to 70 kilometers of lithospheric stretching, which created the central graben. And we can do that by, by moving the halibut host. And that puts it and the South Halibut granite alongside the Yaren Fault. So that the end product is to make the South Halibut Fault into the Yaren Fault by removing the central graben. Now, the Yaren Fault is the boundary between Scotland and Norway. And uh, the Caledonian name for that structure is the Iaftis Suture. So this seems a fairly significant observation. This is a summary diagram of what we've done with that operation. Here's outlined in a hollow shape is the current position of the South Halibut granite. You can see where it was in the pre-Jurassic. And you can see that it has this significant intersection, a fault to the south side of the South Halibut granite has this significant intersection with the Great Glen Fault. This is the area where the Pajosian, Bathonian and Lower Jurassic are preserved in the Inamori Firth. So this could be an area where the strikes that fault in that created these movements that I'm talking about 
were accommodated by uh, down in the Lower Jurassic and Middle Jurassic, the Bajosian Bathonian in the Inamori Firth. Now, there's been uh, disputes about the origin of the application of strike ship vaulting to the Inamori Firth for years, starting with Bob McQuillan, uh, John Underhill's had things to say about it. But I'm just uh, venturing this as a hypothesis for explaining these other observations. Now, what I'm suggesting is that another set of faults were involved in the dismantling of the 40s volcanic center, and that's more shallow dipping faults related to the Caledonian convergence zone, which is around Iapetus. These are more shallow dipping structures, and they act as detachments dismantling the volcanic centers. So this is a fairly radical proposal compared with the mock turtle structure I proposed before. But the mock turtle structure is not, uh, doesn't conflict with this model. It's just part of it. So this is the full model. The volcano that we observed in C1 is actually the original volcanic center, which deposited volcanics in the South Viking and Graben. Its superstructure has been removed by strike strip faulting into the outer Moray Firth. Part of this model is that the, because transtension is involved, the, the compression associated with strike slip faulting, uh, this is partition transtension, the compression that's associated with that gives you some areas of uplift. So if you want to produce an uplifted structure in this area, you don't really need a thermal dome. You just need some sort of strike slip, uh, partition strike slip movement. The, the diameter of the basic intrusion that we've established in the Fisher Bank area gives you the, the amount of extension between your lithospheric structures, intersecting lithospheric structures. It's more like a, instead of a triple junction, it's more like a quadruple junction. And the Fisher Bank basic intrusion is like the roundabout in the middle of that junction. What I'm suggesting is that if as transtension is involved, this area we should look to as a structural comparison is not the Mid-Atlantic Ridge in Iceland, it's the development of Carboniferous volcanism in Scotland and Northumberland. And that's what I'm going to go on to next. I actually published this cross section of uh, the east side of uh, Fife, East Lothian, and Northumberland in 1992. It's hardly ever been referenced since then, although it was peer reviewed by the Burps Group in Cambridge and by Brian Upton at Edinburgh University. I think it's had less than a handful of citations since then. But I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And if I look at it now, I just think, how did I draw this flower structure without really thinking about it? What I intended to suggest was the role of underplating in the Ioptis convergence zone. And Brian Upton subsequently published a paper which identified underplated in this area without citing this paper, which, which I, I, I exchanged emails with him about that. And he was very apologetic. But you can see that what I what I've uh, suggested is that the thermal carboniferous volcanism and the Denantian volcanism are, are tectonically linked. They're not linked by age. And there's probably two different things going on, but it's a similar sort of structural development between the Denantian volcanism and the thermal carboniferous volcanism. And if we look, this is what we can see. If we look at the, the coast around Edinburgh, you can see these thermal carboniferous dikes. You know, this, this one here on the left is on the uh, forefront of uh, just east of Musselburgh. There's another one uh, near Preston Pans. They, they point to the Denantian's volcanic features. They link the volcanic features, but they're a different era of volcanism. They're just developed in the same structural zone. I 
A much more competent structural geologist than me is Nicola de Paula, Durham University, uh, working with Bob Holdsworth. They interpreted transtension in the permocarboniferous, and they involved the Caledonian granite. And that Caledonian granite controlled the development of the type of extension that you've got around it. So alongside the Caledonian granite, you have areas of uplift. These are all the folds that we've been taking to see on the Northumberland coast, very uh, substantial folds. Uh, looks like a lot of compression has been going on, but it's actually related to uh, extension around about. Um, my son is not a geologist, but he's more computer than I am, and he's generated this map from PGS uh, online available data. So this, these are the faults in the Midland Valley of Scotland with a topograph, topographic map superimposed and the outcrop geology of the Carboniferous. I just want to highlight some features in my, you know, uh, didn't even drawing mode. First of all, I'll show you that there is a major basic intrusion in the middle of the Mid Midland Valley, and this has been modelled uh, using magnetic data. And you can see the dimensions of this basic intrusion are rather similar to the ones that have inferred for the Fisher Bank intrusion in the middle of the, in the former middle of the 40s volcanic province. You can see that the volcanic rocks of the Midland Valley are symmetrically disposed around the Bathgate intrusion. The line TLKA is a seismic refraction profile. This was interpreted by Dentith and Hall in 1990. And they said one of the obvious features of that was a set of planar detachments, which detach the Carboniferous sequence from the underlying lower Devonian and lower Paleozoic basement. In fact, they said the crystalline basement of the Midland Valley was, was an almost planar structure across the whole of the Midland Valley. So it's like the Carboniferous and over Devonian sequence is deformed separately from the underlying succession. This was represented in a map form by Dentith and Hall. They suggested uh, what they call them flakes here, the transtensional faults, uh, which all have these names in the left hand map. They all have names. Uh, I think the OF is Orgotry Fault. Uh, I can't remember the other ones, but they, they're basically all part of a linked system, which is linked to this planar detachment, which is detected on a seismic refraction profile. And the planar detachment points you towards the, um, the Bathgate intrusion. There's more than one volcanic center in the Midland Valley, G is the Garden Hills, A is Arthur's Seat, W is the Waterhead Caldera, and M is the Misty Law Volcanic Center. You can see that they have a consistent trend across the Midland Valley in a sort of symmetrical relationship to the Bathgate intrusion. The Bathgate intrusion is significant Secondly, because it's the site of some of the younger volcanism uh, in the Bathgate Hills in the Midland Valley. So volcanism, as I was pointing out, in an intraplate area tends to have these different successive phases, which are separated by periods of erosion. And a former head of the deep geology unit in Keyworth is Bill Reed, a head before my time, but I, I did, uh, we did cross paths. He inferred episodes of transtension in the Midland Valley at the time of the passage group and earlier in the Denantian. Strikes at faulting was quite a strong point of his uh, in his stratigraphic interpretations. I've just highlighted some known lineaments 
in the Midland volume. They've got names in the literature. RS is the Renfrew Strathaven line, which is a line of uh, more evolved lavas in the southern part of the uh, south of Glasgow. And DF is the Dumbarton Fintry line, which is a line of volcanic vents. D is the detachment, which we've identified in refraction data. SUF is obviously the Southern Upland Fault. K is the Kelso line, which pretty well parallels the Scottish border and controls a whole series of vents in the Scottish borders, older vents, in fact. So there is a geometric pattern, which you can see. And if you look closely, you'll see it does control the outcrop pattern of the younger parts of the Carboniferous. So the central coal field lies between these faults, and it has parallel faults defining its limits to these limits I've defined. Now, the big limit here is CL. Now, I've just put that in as an extrapolation of what is called the Kruarkin lineament, identified by Jacques and Reby, controlling Caledonian granites, including the Kruarkin granite. It extends from Mull towards the Bathgate intrusion. Now, you might say, well, you can draw lineaments, anyone can draw a lineament like that. It's crossing all these structural features that doesn't seem to have any effect on it. But that's exactly what the Mole Dyke Swarm does. The Mole Dyke Swarm passes through this area in this direction and ends up on the coast of Tynemouth. In fact, alongside Tynemouth, where I was born, alongside Tynemouth Pier, sort of a distance of 300 kilometers uh, without being hardly deflected by any of these structural elements. So it's possible to draw structural lineaments uh, in any direction you want, but this one has a justification in that it's followed by the, subsequently followed by the more dike swarm. And I don't think really anyone has an explanation for that. I think I'm about coming, this is my, um, oh, I, this, I just put in the aerial extent of the middle Jurassic transtension I identified, which is this blue box on here, and I put it enclosing the Bathgate intrusion. So you can see you, you'd have a hard job pushing all these volcanic centers back over the Bathgate intrusion, but it might be that somehow the extension was differently controlled in the Carboniferous, and there's more than one center. That's really the end of my talk. I just wanted to come back to this headline. And this, this was a press release from Aberdeen University. Yeah, uh, it's part of the media storm that happened, the volcano myth. It says that the so-called phantom volcanoes preventing a huge swathe of the North Sea from being explored for oil and gas don't exist. Well, I think that's correct. The phantom volcanoes don't exist because they're replaced by the real volcanoes. And I wanted to finish with a real bit of mythology, which is uh, Vulcan is a smith of the gods, and he's also the god of the smiths. I also want to say that on my way back from the Sudan, I called in at Vesuvius. In fact, I stayed in Posilipo, which is site of this painting by Joseph Wright, and I took this photograph of the creator of Vesuvius. But my father went one better than me. He saw Vesuvius erupt in 1944. And just like Pliny the Elder, my father was in the Navy, and they both saw the volcano erupt. So one more thing, my last slide, which I'll leave up for a little bit. This is the structure of Vesuvius, what controls the structural setting of Vesuvius. Now, it shouldn't really have anything in common with the 40s volcanic province. It's at an active plate margin. It's got an expanding marine uh, spreading ridge nearby in the Tyrrhenian Sea. But all these structural features that I've talked about have been possibly developed in the Carboniferous and in the 40s volcanic province are actually present here at Vesuvius. If you just look at the fault pattern in the top left map, it's a rectilinear fault pattern. The volcano is actually controlled by those faults, 
the Phrygian fields here and Vesuvius are at right angles to each other. This paper by Castello et al, published in the Journal of the Geological Society in 2006, shows this shallow detachment underlying the Bay of Naples. And the faults that they have, the northwesterly trending faults that they have, are in fact sinistral transtensional faults. If you can see, there's just little arrows indicating the direction, uh, strike slip movement arrows on the faults in the bottom section. And this is the Smith family sitting in Sorrento in 1994. Behind us is the active magma chamber of Vesuvius, which is at a depth of eight kilometers. So the Smiths are paying homage to a volcano again. Thank you.